Hey everybody, welcome and welcome back to my channel. My name is Mikey. You guys are rocking with me on Mikey's Intellectual Corner. On today's episode, we're going to be diving into what's called Kaiserreich by Alternative History Hub. It's going to be a two-parter because this is like a 30-minute video and I don't got that much storage space. No, I'm just playing. But with that being said, today we're doing another recommendation video by Cobalt Fox. I appreciate you. <laughs> with that being said, uh, let's go ahead and get... But there's something belonging to others There's enough for all people to share When it's sunny June and December too Or in the winter time or spring There'll be peace without end Every neighbor a friend With every man a king The war in the West was over. For the second time in 50 years, the flag of the German Empire flew victoriously over Paris. It appeared as if this war was going to be different, but as the First World War, or Weltkrieg, ended, Prussian military might was once again unmatched, leading the Kaiserreich to victory. And yet, even after millions were left dead and nations were in ruin, this was only the beginning. It's often been wondered what the world might have been like had the Central Powers won World War I. It's a common idea in alternate history, been explored in books, movies, but what about in something more niche? Say a mod for the game Hearts of Iron 4, a strategy game that tells events using only pictures, text, and a world map, but with the magic of mod. I like that game, but personally I am more, uh more accustomed to Age of Civilizations. I like the music personally better, but I do like those graphics a lot more though. I'll say that. All right, let's get back into it though. Map, <laughs> but with the magic of modding, knowledge of history, and some good creative vision, this is the world of Kaiserreich, and I want to explore it. The year is 1917. The war has up to this point gone relatively the same. Archduke is shot, things start to get hot, and the overall battles, tactics, and players of the war are the same we all know and love in our timeline. By this phase of the war, the Germans never restart unrestricted submarine warfare, the policy that caused the sinking of the Lusitania and soured U.S. relations with Germany. And, and hopefully they didn't do the freaking Zimmerman telegram too. <laughs> Or, well, that, and hopefully they can help push the isolation more for the U.S., you know what I'm saying? Because I think at that time we were more on an isolation tip. Soured U.S. relations with Germany. And not only do they take preventative measures to assure the U.S. stays neutral, they actively promote anti-war propaganda in the states to sway the American population. Russia, as usual, collapses into civil war, allowing the Germans to keep their gains in the east. 1918. In the West, Britain and France attempt a massive offensive that only ends in failure. While the Central Powers have lost some land in the Middle East and are suffering from blockades in both the North Sea and Mediterranean, the gains by the Treaty of Brest-Lavosk has given Germany a bit of breathing room. Russia is practically out of the war, so Germany can reorganize on the Western Front. The new plan? To hold out, and bide their time another year. 1919. The time has come. Get the boys around, we're dedicating fully to the Western Front. Germany has been able to keep Britain and France at bay, and the Russians distracted long enough to formulate their own new offensive. A blitzkrieg, if you may. This was called the Great Offensive. In March, Germany launches their attack. This new form of modern war overwhelms the Entente, and their line falls apart. Within a matter of months, Paris will be encircled. The French army falls into disarray. Mutinies are abound as the troops become tired of poor planning and failed counterattacks. The stalemate has turned into a rout. Italy collapses as Austria gains ground, and even Ethiopia joins in on the fun. Germany and her allies, despite losing morale and resources from the British blockade, had bid their time and successfully I don't know, I kind of feel like France and UK's, you know, overseas empires and dominions and stuff probably could have helped sustain, you know, the manpower needed for this offensive. Because, you know, um, I'm pretty sure 
by the later half of the war, that's what it was helping them anyway. And I feel like that would probably most likely lead, led to like somebody having to sue for peace or something like that. Most likely France, since they were the ones being invaded most heavily. But to it. British blockade had bid their time and successfully gone on the offensive. France had surrendered, but we'll focus on that in a bit. Britain remained on the sidelines. Without an ally on the mainland, there was really nothing they could do. While on the Western Front, the war had been decided, in the East, another fight was brewing, the Civil War. For another two years, the Bolsheviks and white armies would clash, but unlike in our timeline, the tides were not in the Red Army's favor. Let's go back to 1918. The Bolsheviks had taken control of the state, and their main concern was simply gaining a reasonable peace with the Germans. The Germans, of course, took advantage of the new government's precarious position. Peace only came after another swift offensive as the Central Power armies waltzed up to Moscow, forcing their own concessions that the Bolsheviks had no choice but to accept. Having the enemy manhandle your new government doesn't really look good. The Bolsheviks were not only humiliated by this, but their tentative hold on to power was absolutely destroyed. The Bratislavosk Treaty held, Russia's western holdings were fractured, Ukraine was now an independent state, and the new nations from this really became nothing more than puppets <coughs> loyal to Germany. The White Army had taken over key points in the south, and even parts of the left had rallied against the Bolsheviks. Long story incredibly short, this is the start of the end for the Red Army. Their own forces were infighting, Lenin was assassinated by a disgruntled worker, and the response to root out any enemies of the revolution only... It was seen that uh, unrest in Russia is pretty much their undoing every time. So Russia, if you want to keep strong, stay united, you yeah, feel me? Wants to root out any enemies of the revolution only created more enemies against the failing Bolsheviks. By 1920, Moscow was the last bastion for the Reds, and the White Army, a mix of leftists, pro-monarchists, and anti-communists, had retaken Russia. With the state of their armies, although victorious, the White Army generals, with Kerensky at its head, had no choice but to recognize the previous treaty with Germany. Russia would never hold the lands in the West again. With the dust finally settled by 1921, the greatest fears of the Entente, now defunct, was realized. The Central Powers were now the victors in Europe. In the Mediterranean, Italy was dissolved into a series of states on the peninsula. New treaties pretty much stripped the losing parties of their colonies and divided the spoils. Germany gained a far bigger hold in Africa. Austria actually didn't die, and the Ottomans, as weak as their rule was, regained territory lost to Italy and Britain. Losing has its consequences, and after such a dramatic loss in the West, France was about to have a revolution. Maybe. At 11 a.m. November the 11th, 1921, the final declaration of peace was signed. Peace with honor, it was called. But to the losers of such a war, there was no honor. France suffered through the German offensive for years, losing countless in the fields, only to surrender in Shouldn't have freaking uh, betrayed you, your people there, huh, Italy? I wonder what they what they turned them into. Like, probably like maybe, uh, I think they turned them into like Naples or Papal, back into the Papal States or something? through the German offensive for years, losing countless in the fields, only to surrender in the last minute. Britain controlled the largest empire ever seen in history, and none of that mattered when signing that peace treaty. Resentment from a tired population was hard to miss in everyday life. Such disillusionment had to be channeled somewhere, and ideas once seen as radical I feel like, became uh, demanded as necessary. Bulgarian, what followed for the next like five years would be a transformation Bulgarian, of Western Europe. I mean, One that dramatically uh, began Bulgaria, in the last uh, days of the war, uh, as the German uh, armies surrounded uh, Paris, uh, threatening to take anyway. the entire nation. The army had mutinied, refusing calls by the government for another offensive, after so many had failed. A general strike was organized to shut down France, force the government into a concession, and remove them from power. In under a month, the Third Republic 
would collapse. But before we get to the collapse of yet another French Republic, let's have a chat about syndicalism. Syndicalism was a leftist movement that arose in the late 19th century after the founding of the Confédération Générale du Travail, or General Confederation of Labor in English. <coughs> For simplicity, let's just call them the CGT. The main facet of syndicalism compared to other sects of socialism is the main power in a nation would be in the labor unions themselves. So no central government, but decisions decided by a series of worker-focused collectives. Policies directly in the hands of the working class from the local level to regional and finally national. And this encompasses everything from economics to social policy and even military matters. As describing any ideology, it's more complicated than just that, and it varies. It was more prominent in Western Europe before the start of World War I, especially in France, but fell apart once the Soviets took over in Russia. Yada yada, Red Scare, the leading socialist state is Leninist and eventually Stalinist. Syndicalism never reaches real prominence, but is still around today in small circles. In this alternate timeline, the Red Army in Russia is falling. France, the most... I feel like real quick, obviously he's saying that they went, um, France went to the far left. I feel like it could have easily went to the far right too, just like Germany did um, in our, our timeline, because in their timeline, Frank, uh, Italy still gets kind of effed over, just like they kind of did in our timeline. That's a, they get it way worse than that one, so what's, what's not to stop Mussolini still from the, in this timeline rising up with uh, his ideals, you know? Just saying. And that being spread, and then obviously just like Hitler did, Somebody in uh, in Paris sees his march on Rome, and now he's you know they're emulating the same thing. I feel like that could have easily just happened. Just saying. Army in Russia is falling. France, the most prominent hotbed for syndicalism and socialism, takes the mantle instead. And what better time for an ideology like syndicalism to take charge than when the government itself collapses? A provisional government was established in the Third Republic's place. Think of it like the Kerensky government, where it was at odds with more extreme factions within the country. Socialists and liberals were at odds with the radical notions of the CGT, who believed they, as the leaders of the unions, held rightful power over France. Before the war against Germany was even over, another one had begun. A civil war between the provisional government and the syndicalists. While in the East, the Bolshevik Revolution was as dead as Lenin, in the West, it had only strengthened. The Provisionals knew the military had CGT sympathies and tried to disarm the military under the excuse that the war was coming to an end. The remaining radical portions of the government abdicated in protest and joined the opposition. In a few months, France had gone through two different regimes, and the sole power left in the country with any backing or effective influence was the CGT and the syndicalists. And much like the Bolsheviks of our timeline, a period of violence followed as opponents and remaining sympathizers to the Republic or Provisionals were hunted down, achieving peace with Germany quickly only to secure their own position. In Britain, the Labour and Conservative parties had become ineffective. There was a convoluted election, and failed tariff policies meant to help the economy only led to disaster. Economically, Britain was becoming isolated. One coal shortage and rise in unemployment later, and the economy collapsed. Such a bungled mess of policies had only reaffirmed opinions of the government created since the signing of the treaty. A change had to be made. The labor unions of Britain organized nationally, calling for a general strike in March of 1925. Across the island, the cities were packed with workers calling for better reforms and for corrupt leaders to step down. The response against them was swift, and quickly the situation deteriorated. Whoever began the fighting was never known, but propaganda that it was the military that shot first was soon shared to organizers across the nation. The royal family decided to take a trip to Canada to ride out the storm, but this storm wouldn't pass. 
a revolution had begun. Over the period of three months, the UK... It's crazy that how, after this, after the Great War, essentially, what he's saying, that countries who lost this war are going to have to go either to the extreme right or to the extreme left, no matter what timeline they're in. Which is pretty crazy to think about, but um, I don't know, does that really, does that explain something as us, as you know, our human nature? Or is it, yeah, who knows, you yeah. know? Mm -hmm. A revolution had begun. Over the period of three months, the UK would cease to exist. Parliament floundered in effective response, the workers transformed into militant revolutionaries, and soon even London itself was on the verge of falling. When the capital eventually did fall, any forces loyal to the crown in Old Britain followed the royal family to Canada. The United Kingdom was disbanded. The Union of Britain was born. The ramifications for this were felt across the entire Commonwealth. The land of the crown was no longer in Europe, but instead Canada. And the chaos from the revolution left loyalties and obligations up in the air. Australia and New Zealand banded together into a single confederation, as did Britain's holdings in the West Indies. Their African colonies were quickly swallowed up by the Germans. Moving on to Italy, while it was divided into a federation, even this quickly fell apart as its new nations began to fall under the all right guys real quick actually i'm gonna go ahead and stop it right there uh because that's gonna i'm gonna cut it in half like i said it'll be part two uh with that being said though i i understand with australia and new zealand banding together but would they cut their ties with uh the crown too because they don't have a reason to cut their ties so you know i don't know but with that being said, part two will be out probably in like two, three days. With that being said, thank you for joining me. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. Thank you for joining me on Micah's Intellectual Corner. With that, I'm out. Peace.